The Mongol took them at the word without comment. His first act was to protect himself by organizing the Keshek, the Khan's guard of chosen men devoted to himself. He allowed the nomads who followed him no more idleness to their accustomed haphazard life. He gave a purpose. Instead of a coalition of tribes, the ancient pastoral Ulus, he formed an army, a permanent army of horsemen, with tribes merged into regiments. Into this army he drafted the best of the men able to ride. Over fourteen years of age and less than seventy able-bodied men, not chosen for the army, were given the duty of caring for roads and transport animals. The weaker sort of men, armed only with sticks and whips, cared for the herds. The work in the home encampments he left to the women, the boys, and elders. The new regiments of the cool, or center of the army, kept at home. The guard went. The Khan, the Jungar, or left wing, operated in the east. The Barungar, the right wing, in the western regions. The nomads grew accustomed to the new routine of continued warfare. Women, immature boys, and household slaves kept up the yurts with a new sense of security, while the army led by this strange and flexible Mongol was absent from the home grazing lands. They were safe from raids. This army cleared the steppes from the Altai to the forest of Manchuria. It broke up the powerful Kirait Turks. The officers commanding the new units were kinsmen of the warriors in the ranks. Sons began to take the places of their fathers. By degrees, all the former tribesmen, the Uri Anguts, the Oyurats, Merkits, the reckless Tatars, and the superior Kiraits coalesced into the regiments of the great Ordu. Now, in the spring and autumn, they were allowed to go on the tribal hunts. They'll kill game for food. Spoil taken in battle was divided evenly and sent back to the home yurts. A new economy appeared in the steppes, a military economy regulated by the cautious Mongol, who was suspicious of everything that did not serve him. The other tribesmen began naturally to call themselves Mongols. Grazing lands in the nomad clans of the Lake Baikal region, which formed the confederacy under Genghis Khan. The Mongol Khan made the nucleus of his army from these clans the burial site of the nomad Khans was on the sunny or south side of the Burkhan Khaldun, the mountain of power. Between the headwaters of Kerulan and the Tula rivers, in the year of the leopard, which is twelve hundred and six of the Common Era, their leader summoned. A Kuril Tai to this council of the blood aristocrats came of the blood aristocrats came all the commanders of the army to the home grazing lands of the Mongols at the headwaters of the Anan, and there they named him Genghis Khan. The meaning of this name is doubtful. It may signify the great Khan or the bright shining Khan. Genghis Khan never took the title of Kakan, or emperor. The title of Kakan signifies supreme ruler derived from the Turkish Kagan. Genghis Khan allowed no titles among his new subjects. The only distinctive terms were Sechen, wise, and Bagatur, valiant. There, Genghis Khan made a promise to those 
he called his venomous spiders. My warriors are dark and sturdy, as the many trees of forest. I shall refresh their mouths with sweet sugar. I shall hang brocades upon their shoulders, and seat them in the saddles of swift geldings. They shall drink from clean and pleasant rivers, just as their horses will graze upon high rich grass. From the new roads which serve my people, all harmful things shall be cleared, and no thorn bush or weeds shall grow in their pasture lands. He had been thinking over the mouthings of the soothsayers. Whether he believed them or not, he saw the advantage to be gained by prophecy. The sky, he informed his followers, had appointed me to rule all the generation living in felt tents. He was then forty-nine years of age, and he kept his promise to his nomads, probably to a greater degree than he himself had expected. This poetic chant of his put into words, they understood and fixed in the minds of the listeners without a word written down, it became his testament to them, because he succeeded beyond their utmost expectation. Dreading the outbreak of old intertribal feuds, he made it a crime to quarrel, for one who called himself Mongol to strike another, and... The predatory tribes themselves were fast disappearing into the banners. The regiments, the thousands of the new army of the steppes. From this time, he told those who listened, I shall speak words of mercy, and I shall distribute the thousands of men among those who aided me in this labor. And the shaman, Yukchu, said of him, before the assembled Noyans and Bagaturs, the power of the everlasting blue sky has descended on him here upon earth. He is its agent. This, this to the listeners, appeared most reasonable. Hereafter, in all the acts of the Mongol chieftain, the power of the sky might be expected to appear. Had he not raised his family above others among the Mongols and raised the Mongol clan above thither tent-dwelling peoples? Was he not the offspring of the legendary blue wolf and her uh, heritor of the Borjagoon? Invisible, the guardian spirits of the waters and the forests would bear him company where he went. How much Genghis Khan himself believed this, we do not know, but from that day he acted upon it. Incurably superstitious, like all the non like all the nomads, well, I don't know if you could ever say all of any group, he fought against his superstition. He had the shamans make their predictions before him. He scrutinized the lines in the thigh bones of sheep that they burned in fire. But he shaped his own plans. He would believe nothing outside his own experience. He demanded loyalty among those who served him, the loyalty of a vassal to his master. It became known in the steppes that traitors who brought their lords captive to the dark Khan of the Mongols would be put to death. On the other hand, Genghis Khan was merciful to those who had fought to the end for their masters. Upon such tested loyalty, he put great value. He fought for three days, he said to one of to one Kira'it, to give your lord time and space to escape. Serve me in this way, be my companion. The steppe dwellers understood and appreciated this code. Genghis Khan had no moral inhibitions in dealing with an enemy. Trickery and treachery were weapons to be used as well as steel, but to his own followers he kept his word, a word spoken at sunrise and forgotten at night. It's faithless, he told them. I have promised you mercy. Be content. His supremacy over the tribes did not satisfy him. In the west and south were peoples of the forest who harvested grain and dealt with merchants. The material goods of these people gave them security. This wealth was a permanent thing and might give them power over the tent dwellers. He sent his eldest son to subdue the forest people, the Kyrgyz, and he gave to this son the western forests, a circumstance that had great consequences thereafter. The intelligent Uyghurs made submission after a brief struggle. Among the captives from the Naimans, Genghis Khan encountered a lettered Uyghur, keeper of the seal, Tatatunga by name. He was 
brought forcibly into contact with writing for the first time, discovering that Tata, uh, Tatatunga could make written signs that preserves the spoken Mongolian words, and Genghis Khan ordered that the younger sons of his family should be taught this writing. He summoned learned Uyghurs to talk with him, and he learned much from Arab merchants who could, describe, uh, who could describe the outer world. As with the soothsayers of the steppes, the savage Mongol listened to them, storing up knowledge without following their advice. Well, oracle readers and stuff um, really tend to convey stuff of what they, they just tend to put what they know and what, from reading people or listening or whatnot into different terms. So, Perhaps that's what Genghis Khan was doing with the soothsayers as he was getting past the priestcraft and, well, what do these people really know? The Bride Against the Walls. It was inevitable that the Bongol who ruled the steppes and the Golden Emperor who reigned behind the Great Wall could not exist side by side. The Qin Dynasty had endeavored to drive the nomads further into the northern wastelands. Now the nomads struck back at the wealth of the cultivated lands. Genghis Khan moved with the caution of a stalking animal. He took pains to rid his people of their awe of Cathay and its golden emperor, the son of heaven. He told them, should be an extraordinary man, but this one is unworthy of a throne, and he spat toward the south. Before turning against the Kin Empire, he subdued the strange bandit kingdom of Hasi Hasia on his flank. This gave him experience with his new formations of masked riders, and it cleared his flank. He led the former nomads, now the horsemen of a disciplined army, through the Great Wall with the care of a shepherd tending a flock. He took no chances. In at least one respect, he changed the accustomed tactics of the nomads. Hitherto, the banners or regiments of the steppe dwellers had been loosely knit. Genghis Khan doubled the number of the riders in such a formation. So, in an attack, a new Mongol regiment charged with weight and the power of close formation. In this way, the Mongol commander had fewer units to handle. The kin commanders had planned to attack him. So he struck them first. He unleashed the speed of his horsemen and led them in nomad tactics. In nomad tactics that they understood. In wide circling movements that cut off the slower and more numerous armies of the kin. For the first years he was content with driving off the herds and spo the spoil gathered up by the Mongols after a victory. On the march, he put, his he put his divisions through maneuvers, never relaxing his rigid discipline. Carefully, he avoided the strong walled towns of civilization, retiring swiftly beyond the wall with his gains. Then, when he felt sure of his mounted divisions, he apportioned them under the command of his four sons so that they would be able to strike from four directions at once. The armies of the kin, moving blindly in quest of the Mongols, were broken by this swift concentration. The Mongol had clear information about the enemy. He was well served by his eyes and ears, and barbarian uh, and frontier forces enlisted under the kin went over to the victorious nomads, realizing that this was no raid of tribesmen, snatching up booty, but the method the methodical advance of a conqueror. Those who submitted were well treated, in spite of the tales of a holocaust wrought by the Mongol horsemen in Cathay. Genghis Khan was quick to seize the advantage of these new recruits. The advantage these new recruits gave him. He judged men at a glance and accepted them. In the five years that his columns threaded through North China, it became apparent to the kin soldiery that the Mongols could not be resisted. Only the walled cities 
remain to be taken. Against these, the old Mongol used terror as a weapon. He announced that no lives would be spared in a citadel that resisted a Mongol siege. Carefully, he launched his divisions in their first siege operations. In this, he profited from the advice of the kin officers who had joined his standard, and resistance was crushed with inhuman methodical massacre of all lives within the walls. From this destruction, the Mongols retrieved only the things that might be of use to them in the steppes, the foodstuffs to be carried away, strong young slaves to serve them, wooden stuffs and precious metals and weapons. The rest was torn down, kindled into conflagration. You know, including temples and stuff like that, too. Genghis Khan had determined to leave no walled structures that might shelter men against him in the future. Once he had taken away the harvested grains, he was willing to let cultivated lands be overgrown with grass that could feed horse herds and cattle. Since the beginning of the world, a Chinese exclaimed, No nation has been as powerful as these Mongols are now. They annihilate empires as if they were tearing up grass. Why does heaven permit it? It was not, however, any heavenly force, but the ceaseless vigilance of a savage mind that permitted it. Genghis Khan recognized the value of knowledge possessed by the Kins and Kathayans. They understood matters that his eyes had never seen, and with instant naive curiosity, he grasped at that knowledge. He ordered the philosophers of China to march with him and to talk to him in his tent. At the same time, he commandeered artisans and engineers for his army. Great herds of cattle were moving out to the prairies. Cartloads of grain creaked over the new roads leading out of China. The barrier of the Great Wall was broken down for all time, and Genghis Khan could be sure that his people, the Mongol Ulus, would never lack food while he lived. Whether he himself spoke the name or others, we do not know. But at this time, the family of the Mongol conqueror began to be called the Altine Uruk, the Golden Family. The roads to the west, his subjugation of most of North China, brought Genghis Khan no elation. He knew that work was unfinished, and he placed the left wing of the new Mongol fighting machine there to make an end of resistance, and he took pains to clear his other flank in the mountain ranges of mid-Asia, 1,200 miles away, but now he could rely on his division commanders, and two of them waged a curious warfare among those mountains. They announced that they had come to bring religious freedom to oppressed sects, Peacefully, they galloped past the mosques and Buddhist shrines and Astorian chapels of the five cities, and the little people of the shrines greeted them, refusing to take arms against them. So, the war in the mountains became a manhunt, congenial sport for the hard-riding Mongols in pursuit of the ruler of Black Cathay, the warlord of the mountains. He was cornered and slain with his followers before the mass of the people knew what was happening, and the triumphant Mongols sent back 20,000 white horses to Genghis Khan in the steppes. They laughed and danced in their tents, telling about the success of their manhunt. And from that time it became part of the Mongol strategy to liquidate any ruler who dared make a stand against them. Such a man was condemned to death by manhunt. Do not become too proud, Genghis Khan warned his Tuanbashis, division commanders, by courier. Pride brought Wang Khan of the Kira'its to the end of his life. He was struggling at first to hold in check the brutal reactions of his people. But to the Mongols, human life outside their clan had no value. The Mongol conqueror saw value in it at times as in the skill of the Chinese engineers who could bring siege engines and bridges over the mountain fresh nets. In war, he told his people, 
Be like tigers and peace like doves. Ceaselessly he tried to teach them the iron restraint that he had learned, and watchfulness in daylight he is believed to have told them hunt with the wariness of an old wolf at night with the keen sight of a raven swoop upon your enemies like hawks. The march to the west. Ironically, it was sheer accident that turned his attention to the west beyond the mountains. Otherwise, he might have spent the last years of his life in the steppes, content with the nomad's empire and the tribute from North China. But the old Mongol had become interested in trade. Muslim merchants described to him the wealth of Islam in the West. What Genghis Khan heard, he remembered. He sent merchants and Mongol ambassadors to the nearest of the Western powers. The Khwarezm Shahs, who ruled from Samarkand to Baghdad, that reckless monarch saw fit to allow the merchants to be plundered and killed. Well, not just reckless, in disobedience to Islamic law. He was foolish enough to execute the envoy the Mongol Khan sent to his court to demand the punishment of those who had slain the merchants. Two, the Mongols, the person of an ambassador, was sacred. Same thing with under Islamic law. Two, a Mongol, like Genghis Khan, the injury could only be wiped out by war. He prepared cautiously, trusting nothing and eliminating every chance of failure that he could visualize. Perhaps he had intended this conflict to be. If not, he seized upon it with an instant hesitation. Here was a new golden emperor to be destroyed with the immense armed forces of Islam, a power residing beyond the mountain barrier of Medesha. Well, the difference between the forces of Islam and a uh, Muslim majority of people. A power residing beyond the mountain barrier of Medesha, as the golden emperor had sheltered himself behind the great wall. First, information. The old Mongol questioned traveling merchants until he was satisfied that he knew the strength of the Islamic Shah and the geography of the world beyond the mountains. Spies were sent ahead to provide information later, and a screen of scouts was ordered through the mountain passes. Second, morale. Genghis Khan went alone to a height near the mountain of power and took the covering from his head. The girdle from his waist, for hours he communed with the spirits of the high and distant places, and he came down with a message. The everlasting blue sky had granted victory to the Mongols. Third, mobilization. He took only some 15 divisions of 10,000 men, but these were veterans of the Kin campaigns and were strengthened with Turkish Uyghurs and, a band, and bands of the powerful Kyrgyz brought in by his eldest son, Juchi. The long march from the steppes through the ranges was slow orderly. In the Ordu of Genghis Khan, a young fair wife, Kulan, was included with the geographer of Cathay and learned minds of the Uyghurs. They made their way over the ranges methodically, tending the remount herds and the wagon trains. How methodically they moved, we learn from the account of Taoist Chang Chun, who followed at the order of the Khan on the heights of the Yin Shan, beyond the place of white bones, where a nomad army had perished in forgotten times, passing Sa'iram Lake Chang Chun entered a ravine cut by mountain torrents. When he accompanied the great Khan Chang Chun relates, Chukatai, the second son of the Khan, built the first road through this ravine to the west. He broke down the rocks of the slopes and built no less than 48 bridges of wood wide enough for two carts to pass over side by side. Now at this time, um, Seven or Shias were the most common Shias instead of Twelvers. And Shias out were most of the Muslim population. Um, the terror. The Muslim forces had expected to meet a horde of barbarians. They met instead disciplined divisions, maneuvering in silence 
with amazing speed, according to a plan carefully prepared by the old Mongol. Now, if they were really more into uh, Islamic law, then they would have known that you try to make peace. You try to, you know, give some chances, right? By now, the Mongol man power had been mobilized into a national army for at least a dozen years. To a man, the Mongols had become professional soldiers. They were opposed in the Kin and Western campaigns by fragments of regular armies, court guards, and the immense feudal levies of the time. It is not true, as some historians relate, that the Mongols achieved conquests only over decadent empires. The Turkish Khwarezm Shahs were a young military power. The Seljuk Turks were still to arrive at their full strength and were at that time engaging the Crusaders on even terms. The Georgians, Kipchaks, and Russians were warlike peoples accustomed to victory. The Mongols were, in nearly every case, outnumbered by the enemy. They had the advantage of their permanent military organization. The regiments, unlike most of the feudal forces of the time, were able to maneuver in close formations. Their officers were recruited from the Keshek, uh, the guard, which served as a military school for chosen youths under the eye of the Khan. As evidence of their discipline, we find no accounts of individual bravery among the Mongols in these campaigns. While the Muslim accounts relate the exploits of various heroes, such as Jalal ad-Din, The Mongols remain anonymous in their obedience to the orders of the military genius directing them. These divisions appeared out of the night, striking with blasts of still tipped arrows and heavy bows. Although they were outnumbered, the Mongols, the armies of the Khwarezm Shah, were scattered in a few weeks. The Shah himself became a fugitive, like his former rival of Black. Cathay with a Mongol manhunt at his heels. His life ended in an island of the Caspian where the Mongol horsemen could not reach him. He died of exhaustion and terror. The scattered armies were given no chance to reform. Genghis Khan was trusting to speed of movement. He had brought the tactics of the hunt into warfare. In the West, cities were stormed or tricked into surrender and demolished in a few days. For the first time, the Mongols devoted themselves to inspiring terror. Confronted by superior numbers of a warlike race utterly alien to the steppes, they waged a war of extermination against the multitudes. They led out the peoples of walled towns, examining them carefully and ordering the skilled workers who would be useful to move apart. Then the soldiers went through the ranks of Helpless human beings killing methodically with their swords and hand axes as harvesters would go through a field of standing wheat. They took the wailing women by the hair, bending forward their heads to sever the spine the more easily. They slaughtered with blows on the head. Men who resisted weakly in some places, the Muslims say, not even the dogs and cats survived the passing of the Mongol horsemen. Terror fell on the cultivated lands of Islam like a pall, interrupting communications, sending the living into hiding. It paralyzed the will to resist, and it lasted for years.